Good to see everybody. Uh, it's an interesting title. Why bother going to church? Well, we're all here, so it's like preaching to the choir, right? But we know from our children, in our families, at work, at school, with our friends, a lot of people would ask us that question. Why bother going to church? I can be a good person. I don't go to church. I'm a good person. Don't you think I'm a good person? We hear that all the time, right? And for us, it might not be necessary, but for us, as you know, St. Peter says, to be able to give a defense, well, this is perhaps something we should think about. And so I'm going to hopefully try to talk for only about 20 to 30 minutes, and then we'll have time for questions as long as you want. But I have to tell you, I do have to be out of here by 5 o'clock, so I can't be longer than 5 o'clock. So, okay. so I'll stay as long as you want, okay? Okay. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. C.S. Lewis, the well-known um, Christian writer writer of fiction, literature um, expert, who taught at Oxford and Cambridge in the uh, middle of the last century. He says at one point, everyone has noticed how hard it is to turn to God when everything is going well for us. We have all we want is a terrible saying when all does not include God. We find God an interruption. I'm going to begin with a story uh, from a book called uh, Ask Me Anything. It's uh, by a man, a professor who teaches government and philosophy in Austin, Texas. His name is Jay Budzeshevsky. Uh, he speci specifically um, works in natural law and he wrote a couple of books just based upon his experiences with the students in the university. And it happens that he was teaching a course on the founding fathers in America and their philosophical background and how, what they thought, how the, how, the, how the state should be ordered. And among other things, the whole issue of God in the state. So he does his lecture and after the lecture, this young man um, who he calls Nathan, it's not his name, but he calls Nathan, comes into the office and says, you know what? I understand all the government stuff, but what about that God stuff? Like, what does that have to do with government? And he asked him, he says, well, it sounds to me like you're asking why is the most important thing the most important thing? And the young man says, well, I don't know. Is it like, is there a God? And he says, well, what, what do you believe? He says, well, I'm an agnostic. I used to be, you know, I used to be a Christian and pray and go to church and stuff. But then I got older and I thought, uh, you know, who knows? So now I'm an agnostic. I say, maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't. I don't have a position on the, on, on the question. And then the professor says, well, I don't believe in agnostics. And the guy says, well, what do you mean I'm here? He says, yeah, I believe you're here, but I don't believe there is such a thing as an agnostic. And the guy says, well, what do you mean? Like, I, you know, I, I don't know one way or the other. And he says, oh, no, I believe that you probably do. And the young man says, if I don't know the answer to the God question, then how could I be committed to an answer to the God question? And the professor says, commitments are reflected in movements of the will. What does that mean, he asked. They're reflected in how we live. And so for the beginning here, I just want to read you how that conversation played itself out. The young man says, are you saying that if you asked me questions about my life, then you could tell me what answer to the God question I'm committed to? Possibly. Then do it. I want to know. I hesitated. All right. You asked for it. Do you pray? I used to sometimes, but I stopped. Seemed kind of pointless since I didn't know whether anyone was listening. Do you have plans for the future? I'll probably go to law school. There's always work for lawyers. They make pretty good money, and I think I'd like the work okay. What do you aim for in life? Not getting bored. Having enough money to buy the things that I want. Not working all the time. Having fun. Will you get married? Have kids? 
I'm okay with my sex life as it is. If it gets old someday, then maybe I'll settle down. Kids, I don't know. That seems like a pretty big interruption in my life. But hey, this isn't too bad. How am I doing? I smiled. No more questions. He smiled back lopsidedly. Sorry my answers were so uninformative. What makes you think they were uninformative? Well, they didn't really reveal a commitment like you were expecting. Oh, on the contrary. You mean they did? Of course they did. Nathan, there is no such thing as neutrality. Every way of life is some way of life. Inevitably, you live either as though there were a God or as though there weren't. You stake your life on an answer you say you don't have. So which answer am I staking my life on? Consider the question about whether you pray. You say you don't know whether anyone is at the other end listening. But if you're really not sure, then why not say, I'll pray because maybe there is. Instead, you say, I won't because maybe there isn't. That makes sense only if it's really true that there isn't. He paused. Light dawned. Yeah, I see that. Or consider my questions about your future. You say you don't know whether God is real. But if you're really not sure, then in planning your future, why not ask, what use might a good God have for my gifts? Instead, you consult only your pleasure. Even if the meaning of happiness is merely pleasure, which, by the way, it isn't, that makes sense only if you can be sure that no such God does take an interest. I guess that's right, too. Or take those questions about marriage. Marriage is either about the total gift of yourself to your spouse or about personal sexual convenience. The former way of viewing it makes sense if a self-giving God created it. The latter way makes sense if on, only if he didn't. You didn't give the former way a single thought. That's true, I see where you're going. Where? You're saying that I live as though there were no God. Right, you say you're uncommitted, but in practice you're committed to atheism. Nathan was unperturbed. But Prof, since I don't know the answer to the God question, how else can I live? I answered, instead of living as though there were no God, you could try living as though there were. That was when the other shoe dropped. His face turned ashen. You mean, like pray? That and other things, seek his will and follow it. How can I seek what might not be there? If you did seek it, you might find out. And remember that. We're going to come back to that at the end. So the title of the talk is Why Bother Going to Church? The Benefits and Blessings of Parish Life. A better title would be this. I've got a good job, a great spouse, beautiful children, a nice car, a healthy bank account, a satisfying hobby, good friends, a cottage in the Kawarthas, I vacationed in Europe, I have a great life. Why bother going to church? Well, we're going to talk about three reasons. One reason is going to be the, what we might call the worldly reasons. One set of reasons is going to be what we, we, we might call the philosophical or metaphysical reasons. And then we get to the big reason. So for the worldly reasons, the secular reasons, the things that the self-help books and the success books that you see on the shelves in chapters, the things that they all talk about as well. Uh, if we go to church, if we're part of a... Uh, part of a Christian community. We will have, for example, mental health benefits, okay? It's just a matter of fact that in issues, with issues like addictions or depression, or you know, when it gets to something like suicide and all, belonging to a good, normal, well-functioning Christian community is very helpful. The whether one, it prevents one from statistically falling into one of those problems or getting out of one of those problems. And it's really amazing when you read, for example, about addictions, you know, like alcoholism or something, how big the spiritual element is, okay? That it's very good to be part of a Christian community. That's just a fact. We have the social benefits. You know, we have friends. I have people in my parish, they say, you know, I have my work friends and I have my church friends. But when push comes to shove, it's my church friends that I can always depend on. You know? So we have the friendship. We have a bigger, wider community. 
you know, it's not just my family, my work, maybe, you know, my hockey team, whatever it is. We have a large community. We're part of something bigger. We have a sense, especially as Orthodox, we have a sense of tradition, of connectedness, of identity, and that will involve some type of ethnic identity, because we remember, even the Americans, even the Canadians, that's some type of ethnic identity, right? You can't live outside of a cultural context. Everything in life is culturally contextualized. So some of us might have Greek ancestry, some of us might have Ukrainian ancestry, whatever. But we have connectedness to that through our church. We have um, the sense of the tradition both in the cultural way as well as in the ecclesial way. We have something really, really big, which is forgiveness. And, you know, just think of a think of a world or a family or society where there is no forgiveness. Just think of that. That's probably a good definition of hell, right? I don't know if you ever heard there's a saying, they say, hell is when everybody is right. You know? <laughs> hell is when everybody's right. You know, that we are, I mean, this is, this is the message of the cross, is forgiveness, right? That's the center of our faith, is forgiveness. So we have forgiveness and we have unchanging positive values. Okay, unchanging positive values. Uh, that is something which is really important in a world which changes daily. We have seen more changes in society, in the world, in technology, uh, in popular culture within the past 30 years, probably than all of history up to that point combined. Just gigantic. So that having an unchanging set of positive values, especially now, is important. And then, this might seem odd, but under the category of the worldly or secular benefits, we also talk about spiritual benefits. Being Greeks, you'll understand this, because in English we don't have the same difference. You have the pneumatiki and the kosmiki and the um, um, psychiki, right? So the kosmiki is the worldly, right? The pneumatiki is what we would say spiritual, but then you have the um, psychiki, which in English they use the word spiritual, but it's actually of the soul, right? And so I'm using spiritual in that sense, in the sense that you walk into the chapters and there's these whole, you know, shelves of books about spirituality and You'll have witchcraft and this and that and everything else going along, as well as atheistic spirituality and everything else, right? Okay? So, when we belong to a church community, just in that human spiritual sense, we understand that everyone has a spiritual dimension. Everybody is spiritual. Just by virtue of being a human being, you're spiritual. You can't change it. And some people who, who get it, you know, whether they are believers or not, they understand that. So in the church, in a parish community, we are able to cherish and cultivate our spiritual nature. We cultivate closeness to God, closeness to neighbor, and we understand the importance of knowing ourself and cultivating inner peace. And this is nothing that's strictly Christian. All of these things, to cherish and cultivate our spiritual nature, Closeness to God, closeness to neighbor, knowing oneself, inner peace. These are all things that many people who are not Christian would say absolutely. I mean, what I think it was the first, the first commandment of Apollo was know thyself, right? That's something that comes from pagan times. You find throughout many different um, uh, cultures and religions. So all of this, this, these psychiki, these reasons of the soul... They're real, they're here in our communities, but they're not specifically Christian. So that's one set of reasons why we have benefit from coming to church, being part of a spiritual community. Then we move on to the philosophical or the metaphysical reasons. You know, in church, we deal with the big questions, the most important thing. So, what is life for? What is life for? People sometimes will think about that. What's the meaning of life? 
Does it have meaning? Is it possible to live without meaning? The fact that we can consider meaning might indicate to us that there must be meaning, just like the fact that we have eyes shows us that there's such a thing as light, okay? And even the stuff we can't see, like atoms, we're able to understand because of the way we are created. So this whole question of meaning is gigantic. Another question like that is, what is happiness? What brings happiness? Okay? Another one, what is true and what is real? Nowadays, you know, there's such a... Just, you know, if you really want to know what the culture is about, watch commercials on TV. Now, I don't watch any TV during Lent, and I watch very little outside of Lent, but when I do, you know, watch a football game and see the commercials on there, you can tell a lot about the society by what is on the commercials. You know, you know Coke is the real thing, okay? So truth and reality, that's really big. People want something authentic, and any of you who have any kids or no kids or teach children in school or whatever, you know the kids can smell they can, you know, smell uh, 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 something uh, which isn't true and real and authentic a mile away, right? Okay? You can't fool kids. So just authenticity, truth, reality. Can all truth and reality be apprehended simply by science and materialism? That is, by the way, the assumption in all of the schools and universities, with rare exceptions, since the Enlightenment, that's become the prevailing worldview. Science, and how, again, how many times have you seen a, 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 um, a newspaper or magazine article or, or seen something on TV with a documentary? Science has done this, discovered that, will do this, etc. And if you think about it, well, science measures, weighs, does experiments, and draws conclusions from that. And as, and it's a good thing, we're not against science at all, but as we get more and more information, we can delve deeper into the deeper realities of the cosmos, those particular theories might and do change. And there's nothing wrong with that, but to say that because on the basis of what I can weigh and measure, I can then extrapolate to what existed before the Big Bang, that's not scientific. So there's a difference between science and scientism, and that is something that we encounter all the time. So what is true and real? That's a question we deal with in the church community in a different way than is dealt with in a science class. And they're both valid. A really nice quote, and I, I can't remember the guy's name. He was a, a very famous scientist at the beginning of the 20th century. He said, are faith and science opposed? He said, yes, they are. They are opposed in the same way that my fingers and my thumb are opposed. For with them, I can grasp anything. Another big question, what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? What does sex mean? Relationships, what are they? What is a family? These, these questions are all over, and you guys know it. Okay, like, nobody knows what's going on. What it is, what's a man, what's a woman, what's a family, what's, you know. These are important questions, because as we know, and believe me, 25 years as a priest, all dysfunction, in society boils down to family dysfunction. All dysfunction in a church or a parish boils down to family dysfunction. If you have a father who's like really out there over the place, whether he's the biological father or the spiritual father, it ain't gonna be pretty, right? So it's really important we understand what the human being is. We understand what it is to be man and woman. We understand what the relationship between man and woman is, what the marriage is, what the various relationships should be, what the family is, etc. And unless that is understood and um, lived out clearly, 
um, you know, we're all sinful, but we try our best, uh, it's, it, it just becomes chaos, which is what we have today. It's chaos in society. Society is... If you had children, and you said to them, uh, do what you want, they would say you're a pretty bad parent, right? You say, no, you do this, you don't do that. This will be good for you, this won't be good for you, right? But yet, when you have a society, a government says, do what you want. Mm. So, we've gone through the worldly reasons, the psychological benefits, mental health benefits, the social benefits, the spiritual benefits of going to church. We've gone through the philosophical reasons. We deal with the big questions. What is life for? Does life have meaning? What is true and real? Uh, what does it mean to be a human being, etc.? And so we come to the most important reason. I was at a monastery down in the States at the beginning of March, and I was talking to one of the nuns, and I said, oh, i got to give this talk over at All Saints Church in Toronto. And, you know, the, the title is, um, Why Bother Going to Church? And she just immediately blurted out, because Jesus Christ is there. <laughs> so we come to the most important reason. We come to the church because in the church we encounter Jesus Christ. And all that other stuff is true, but it's not the main thing. So in encountering Christ, you encounter the true God. You encounter the true man. You encounter the true church. You encounter true saints. You encounter true scriptures. More important than that, even you encounter the true interpretation of the scriptures, because everything needs to be interpreted. Ultimately, the life in the church is a spiritual path which demonstrably leads people to holiness. So it's about holiness. It's about becoming Christ-like. It's about God's grace. Uh, many of you probably know that Elder Porfirius of Attiki was canonized at the end of November this past year. You know, uh, read his life. Read the teachings from Elder Paisios. Read the teachings from Mother Gavridia. Read all these saints, not from, reading from long ago is good too, but from our own times, that in our own day, people are sanctified, people become holy. This is why we go to church. Like Metropolitan Hirotheos of Lachos wrote, he said, the job of the church is to make relics. Okay? So, ultimately, every statement must be either true or false. The question we all have to answer is, is Jesus who we claim he is? Yesterday, if you came to church, that was the question that Jesus asked to the apostles in the Gospel of St. Mark. Just like he asked in the Gospel of Matthew, who do you say that I am? And we all have to answer that question. And we just know, it's just a matter of fact, that many, many people for almost 2,000 years claim that Jesus Christ is real, that he's alive, and that he is active in their lives. Now come back to our friend C.S. Lewis. In the book Mere Christianity, he wrote his... He, wrote this very famous thing which I call the trilemma. You know what the dilemma is, right? It's two, this or that, right? But they call this the trilemma because it's three things. And he says at one point, he says, to take Jesus Christ, you know, some people just say, well, I can accept him as a great moral teacher, but he wasn't God. And C.S. Lewis says, that's the one thing we, we absolutely cannot say. Because either he was and is who he claims to be, the pre-eternal Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, etc. Or, he is mentally ill, a man who is so out of it that he's just totally insane on the level of someone who thinks he's a poached egg. That's a quote. And, or, he is the devil of hell. He says, either he's God, He's crazy, or he's the devil. You gotta take your choice. Because the one thing we can't say about him is that he was a great moral teacher. Because if he was the devil, <laughs> or if he was insane, you know, that doesn't work. Okay? So this is the question we all have to answer for ourselves. Who is Jesus Christ? If he is truly God, then either we turn to him or we turn 
away from him. So if we turn to him, we're going to go to church. But, and there's always a but, if all of this is true, if Jesus is who we believe him to be, then simply going to church, that is simply attending services, is not enough. Worship, participation in the holy mysteries, personal prayer and reading of scripture, fasting, deeds of mercy, conducting our lives in accordance with the norms of Christian morality are also essential. So here's the deal. If Jesus is who we believe him to be, and if the church is the place where we meet him most intimately in worship, in the holy mysteries, and in his body, which is the church, and if we want to know him, then we cannot do otherwise than to attend church services on a regular and frequent basis. But we've got to do all the other stuff, the prayer, the fasting, the deeds of mercy, etc., as well, because Christianity functions as a system. And this is a really important point. You all know what a mousetrap is, right? You have a little block of wood, you have a little, um, what do you call it, a metal U-shaped thing, which is the trap, you have a spring, you have a hook, you have a little trigger where you put the piece of cheese so the mouse comes and eats it and then boop, and that's it. So it functions as a system. If you, for example, build a mouse trap, but don't use a spring, it's not just a less effective mouse trap. It's not a mouse trap at all, right? And that's the way, the, especially the Orthodox, the true Christian uh, uh, church functions, that it's, it's a system. You need to go to church. But if all you say is, I'm going to go to church on Sunday morning, very soon you'll stop going to church on Sunday morning because it works as a system. In order for it to function effectively, you need to go to church. You need to approach for the holy mysteries, confession, communion, baptism, marriage, uh, yevkelion. You need to be praying at home morning and evening. You need to be reading the holy scriptures a little bit every day. You need to be doing deeds of mercy. Go visit Yaya at the Yerokomio, okay? You need to be doing all of these things, living a moral life. You know, you can't be, you know, uh, doing all these other things and then, uh, what do you call it, extorting money from your co-workers or uh, what do you call it, your um, clients or whatever. You know, you can't be stealing and doing other immoral things and expect it all to work. So it functions as a system. Now, let's come back to Nathan, the university student. He claimed to be an agnostic, but in actuality, his life proved that he was an atheist. So we have to admit that the worst thing we can possibly do is to claim to be a Christian, but live a life which is atheistic or pagan or idolatrous or worse. And this is a gigantic problem with the Orthodox. You know, when they do um, these surveys and stuff, and in Canada, we're, we don't have enough people, so we don't really have it here. But in the United States, it comes out, you know, they do these uh, surveys and they find out that the Orthodox, you know, quote unquote, Orthodox Christians have the same attitudes towards, you know, things like, you know, abortion or whatever that their neighbors have. So something ain't right somewhere. Uh, you know what a pagan life is. The pagan is the guy that says, God, I'm going to do this for you and you've got to do that for me. It's a quid pro quo. Well, that's not what Christianity is, you know. Idolatry. Ultimately, idolatry is all self-worship, right? Self-worship. And we have a lot of that in our society. You deserve a break today, right? You're the center of everything. What do you want? Have it your way, right? Well, we can't have any of that. We accept the gospel. And a good thing to do for all of us is to read the Sermon on the Mount, chapters 5, 6, and 7 of St. Matthew's Gospel. Every month, if you can do it, every two weeks, if you can do it, and consider all those things that Jesus says and how that manifests itself or doesn't manifest itself in my own life. So we don't want to be Christians, well, claim to be Christians, 
but actually acting like atheists or pagans or idolaters or worse. You know, again, we come back to the kids. Kids can smell a hypocrite a mile away. And the really interesting quote about hypocrisy says, hypocrisy is the tribute that vice pays to virtue. Hypocrisy is a tribute that vice pays to virtue. You know, we always try to make it look good. We always try to rationalize everything away. Well, we can't do that. We have to just live a simple, authentic Christian life. And if we do that, one of the things we'll do is we'll go to church. And to finish off with two more quotes, one by our buddy C.S. Lewis and one by our Lord. C.S. Lewis says, Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. And then in the Gospel of St. Matthew, in chapter 7, 21st verse, uh, something that we should all remember, especially priests. Our Lord says, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Thank you. So, any questions, any comments? The first one is always the most difficult to elicit. So who wants to be first? Please. How do you go about changing the minds of the like children like Nathan or that that person who has already made those decisions? How do we bring back those young people into the church? Yeah. Um, I think that there are a couple of things that need to be said before we even ask the question. How do you change the minds of the young people who've already, you know, they've they've gone off, they've made their decisions. How do you bring them back? One thing I'm pretty well convinced of now is, for example, in the Orthodox Church especially, especially for the Orthodox, if kids aren't raised from when they're, before they can even remember in the house, they always praying, always going to church, always hearing about God, hearing the Bible stories, etc., learning to cross themselves, kiss the icons, etc., if they don't have that, and they grow up in a house which happens almost everywhere now where there's no real engagement with prayer, with worship, with mysteries, with church communities, anything. Maybe they go to church on Christmas Eve when they visit their grandma or something, right? If you have a kid that's brought up that way, who goes to public schools and, and Catholic schools, actually in, in, in Canada now, because they're really not very different. Um, that kid is now 16, 17, 18, 20. And I start telling them about what we do and what we believe. Likely is not, they're just going to see me for some old benighted guy who just either is putting on a show so he can get a paycheck or else just crazy. Okay? So, that's the reality. So, how do you deal with that reality? Well, the only way we can deal with that, and again, I'm convinced of this now in our society, is the way that the early Christians did. Because we remember in the first three centuries of, you know, the, what they now call the Common Era, first three centuries after Christ, right, that the Christians were this little persecuted group with no, no power in a worldly sense at all, and all they did was love each other, right? And from that, they changed the entire world. And it is un, uh, how do you say, incontrovertibly true. You cannot argue this point 
that no one in the history of the world made such a positive difference in the world as Jesus Christ, and nothing like Christianity ever made such a positive difference in the world. You're not going to get that statement, you know, written in most, you know, popular magazines and newspapers and stuff, but it is undoubtedly true. You just look at all of the good that has happened because of the gospel. Well, a lot of our problem now as Orthodox is that we have, you know, it, everything's become institutionalized, and that's a normal part of life. We're human beings. We institutionalize everything. That's what we do. But if we just say, okay, now I have a parish, and we do a bingo so we can pay our priest, and, you know, we do our Sunday school and this, that, so everything is fine. Well, no, it's not fine, because what we need to have are, you know, tight communities where people look after one another. I mean, I'm sure many people here, or your parents, or your grandparents, um, they went through World War II and Civil War in Greece, right? Okay? And when you have, you know, from where my family is from, they had, 80 years ago, a big famine. They had World War II. They had the communists, okay? And in situations like that, where you have to deal with great evil, sometimes people are crushed by it. But very often, they will rise to the occasion. There will be great deeds of charity and courage and love, okay? Remember that quote from the very beginning with C.S. Lewis? He says, everyone has noticed how hard it is to turn to God when everything is going well for us. We have all we want is a terrible saying when all does not include God. We find God an interruption. There's a saying in Ukrainian, they say, if you want to ruin somebody, give them everything they want, right? So I think that to turn it around, first of all, no, none of us converts anybody else. If there's conversion, it's God. But if we want to facilitate conversion, we have to have, we, li we have to live, that's why I mentioned this Sermon on the Mount, we have to live the gospel. We have to have that love for everybody, that unconditional love. And we have to manifest that, first of all, in our families and in our parish communities. Because if a person comes into the parish community, and the first thing they get is, what are you doing here? You know, this is for Ukrainians, you know, oh, okay. What does that have to do with the gospel? You know, so that's really, I think that's all we can do. You, you're not gonna argue anybody into the church, okay? But you just have to live an authentic Christian life. And if you do, you have a half decently good chance that maybe your kids are gonna stay with the church. And you have a half decently good chance that maybe somewhere down the road, somebody you know at work or at school or whatever might just get so totally screwed up and might actually be willing to hear what we call the good news, the Evangelion, that they're going to say eventually, you know what, I've tried everything else, I'm not happy. Maybe this crazy stuff, maybe there is something to it, because these people are peaceful. So th I think that's the only way we can do it now, you know, because really it's, the world is a very difficult place. You know, the big difference, I, we were at a diocesan conference a bunch of years ago, and one of the guys got up, you know how we like to pontificate and we have all the answers, right? One of the guys got up and said, I don't know what's going on, our church is losing members. Jesus, he didn't have any magazines or television or internet or anything and we have all of this so our priest should it's always the priest our priest should be out there you know uh, getting people into the church and using all these means and our bishop should be out there on television and all of this and you know, and that kind of talk and you know so i got up after him i said well you know we are really behind the eight ball because in jesus time whether you were a pagan Greek, or a Hebrew, or a whatever, you knew what sin was. Everybody understood there was such a thing as sin, right? Our problem today is, if you don't belong to a church, there ain't no sin. So if there ain't no sin, what do you need Jesus for? Okay, so in that sense, I really do believe the... The, 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 the job is harder today than it would have been in Jesus' time and in the first centuries of Roman, you know, Roman Empire there. 
but by the same token, that shouldn't deter us because when the, you know, when the, when the task is more difficult, the reward is greater. You know the, 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 the quote from Abba Isihirion from the Desert Fathers. They say, Abba, you know, uh, what, what, what do we do? He says, we fulfill the commandments of Christ. He says, well, what will our descendants do? You know, the, the monks. He said, well, they will fulfill them, but only half as much. And what about, what will people do in the last time? And he says, in the last times, there will be no ascetic ascesis, no ascetic endeavor at all, but there will be such, such, such temptation that in those days, anybody, who's, anybody who you know, basically keeps the faith will be greater than us or our fathers. So again, you know, the greater the temptation, the greater the difficulty, the greater the reward. Okay? In the beginning of your uh, talk, um, you claim that it is environment for the child that will make them turn to faith and the church. Um, I am a converted Orthodox Christian. I come from a Judeo-Christian family originally. And whereas we were taught by God and we were taught faith, uh, we were... Uh, not church goers. I was the only one in my family who was from a child. So my question is, what do you think about predetermination other than just environment or mm -hmm. an implanted inner desire yeah. for holiness? Yeah. The question has to do with, with the children. Um, not just the fact that we have a particular environment, a particular family, particular people we are related to, etc., uh, particular circumstances, but what about the idea that you use the word predetermined? Are you asking, are you talking about almost predestination or are you talking more about the nature nurture? Uh, predestination. Okay, yeah. Uh, okay, let's, let's take a side trip and talk about John Calvin, okay? At, in the 16th century, uh, everyone here has probably heard of a Christian Reformed Church or a Presbyterian Church, correct? Okay. Those are results of the Protestant Reformation, specifically of a reformer by the name of John Calvin, who taught based on several texts, and this is why I made the comment earlier about the interpretation. Not just enough to have the right Bible, but you have to interpret it correctly, just like anything else, interpretation is gigantic. Based on a couple of texts, he came up with a teaching that in classical Calvinist terms, there is double predestination. Some people are predestined before the world even begins to go to heaven, and some are predestined to go to hell, and there's nothing you can do about it. Okay? So from the orthodox standpoint, uh, we absolutely don't agree with that. We believe that people do actually have free will and we are able to turn to God or to turn away from God. God gives us the freedom to be able to say no to God. Okay? Um, the, um, in the scripture we read, for example, in the prayer of Manasseh and in other places, in uh, the book of uh, Jonah, which we'll read next week, during Holy Week, that God repents and what is met metania is the change of the noose, the change of the mind, right? So God changes his mind. That's in the scripture. St. John the Baptist starts preaching. Jesus starts preaching. What's the first thing they say? Metanoite, right? Repent. Metanoite. Yeah. Repent. And that means the change of mind. So we don't believe in predestination in the way the Calvinists do that. But as far as some people having a, a predisposition to spiritual life. Yeah, I've seen that. I've seen that. And I think that it's like anything else. You know, some of the young people are going to have, uh, a, a, something will draw them to sports, or something will draw them to music, or something will draw them to art, or whatever. And that's, that's fine. That's there too. But, you know, if you have a kid who can be 10 times better than Wayne Gretzky, but he lives in Panama, and there ain't no ice, and there ain't no hockey rink, and there ain't no hockey stick, and there ain't no hockey puck, 
he will never become a good hockey player. So, you know, this is that whole nature-nurture thing. The, the point is they're both important. They're both important. Some will go farther and some will go, you know, not so far. But in the spiritual life, you know, that's the beauty of it, that it doesn't matter how fast you can run. As long as you are on the path and as long as you are facing in the right direction, you have eternity. <laughs> so it doesn't matter if you run or you walk or you crawl or whatever, right? So that's the point, to be on the path and to be facing the right direction. Okay? Please. Um, what do you say to people um, when they don't attend church because they think there really isn't a God because there's so much evil that's on the earth? They say, for example, well, if there was a God, this wouldn't happen to me or that wouldn't happen to me. Why are these, all these bad things happening? So what do you say to people like that? I personally tell them, have you forgotten there's a devil? And if, if the devil, well not if, since the devil does bother us, um, how do you get rid of him? Yeah. We're going to read the book of Job next week as well. That's a, that's a good place to start. Um, yeah, the whole issue is what is called classically theodicy. If God is good, why do bad things happen? And some people take that. And you know what's really, you know, and you, you don't want to minimize it, but you almost want to laugh at it when, you know, something like Katrina hits and people who are atheists say, well, this was an act of God. You know? You think of the insurance language, right? You know, a hurricane is an act of God. I won the lottery. Man, I'm, I'm a good guy. But a hurricane is the act of God, right? So, ultimately, if people don't want to go to church, there's nothing you can do. And ultimately, if my kid doesn't want to do his homework, he'll find a way not to do the homework, right? God gave us the free will. But when people start looking at those kinds of rationalizations, I think it depends where it's coming from. For some people, it truly can be a place of great hurt and brokenness. I had a guy in a parish here in, in Toronto who, when I would go to bless the house of Theophany, his wife was a member of the parish, but he wasn't, technically. But she would never be home. He'd always be home. And I'd show up at the door. I'd say, oh, I'm here to bless the house. Says, you know, your, your wife, oh, no, she's not. But come on in, Father, come on in. And so I'd bless the house with him. He'd never come to church. But we'd sit and talk, and he was a really nice guy. And it turned out the guy went through World War II. He saw lots of atrocities, and he just couldn't get his brain around it. He, he dealt with it as well as he could. So for people like that, you just have to be very compassionate. I mean, that's, they're in God's hands, right? You pray for them, and they're in God's hands. And that's okay. Other people want to make a big deal of it. You know, demonstratively say, I'm not going to, because God is this and God is that. Well, I think that people who aren't doing what it takes to know who God is shouldn't start talking about God. It's okay for them to say, I just don't understand it. I don't believe in God. I don't understand the whole evil thing. But then it's another step to say, so God is horrible. Well, I'm sorry, you don't have the right to say that. You're not going to church, you're not praying, you're not reading the scriptures, you're not this and that. On what basis are you going to make that assumption? Okay, and again, especially people who act like that kid, the university student, who conduct their life as if there is no God and that something bad happens that they blame God for. Well, you know, that's it. Also, we have to admit, that whether we're Christian or not, whether we're believers or not, there is such a thing... I don't know if you have a similar saying in Greek. In Ukrainian, there's a saying where they say, nothing bad ever happened that something good didn't come out of it. <laughs> yeah? Okay. And, and that's really true. Uh, if, if you want to read a, a neat little meditation on this, get the C.S. Lewis book, The Problem of Pain. You can get it in chapters. There's good stuff in chapters, too, besides all the... <laughs> The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis, where he talks about how, you know, what does God have to work with? Well, this is the world and this is the people. So this is what he has to work with. So somebody does something bad, you start a war. But then that gives people the opportunity to 
manifest self-sacrifice and love and courage, etc. So you can, you know, pull good things out of the bad. Another really interesting book by C.S. Lewis, which has to do with this also, is called The Screw Tape Letters. Did anybody ever read The Screw Tape Letters? These are good books for like non-orthodox Canadian kind of people, okay? Um, and it's basically a senior devil in hell writing letters to his nephew, who's a junior devil in London during World War II, giving him tips on how to pull the guy who he has to tempt into hell with him. So it's like diabolical psychology, okay? Uh, some will find it creepy, but it's, it's re it really, and it really does explain this kind of thing, that thinking process. So those, you know, that's the kind of thing that I would say. Um, again, authenticity, we, re we know there are lots of inauthentic Christians. We have to admit there are lots of inauthentic non-believers and atheists and agnostics, etc. too. And no matter who you're dealing with, whether it's an atheist or an agnostic or a Christian or whatever, if they're not authentically uh, uh, witnessing to their core beliefs, you can't do anything with them anyway. Because they're just blowing around in the wind. And that's most of the people we deal with. Okay. Who else? I think you had something. Um, we always want to be positive and very hopeful in the world. And uh, we deal with a lot of different people. And we see some of the things that you've talked about where... Um, People lose the meaning, they don't want to go to church anymore, they don't see the point of it, they become agnostic, but in reality, they're atheists. And I just want to ask you, we want a better world, we want a revival. Is that something that won't happen? Is apostasy have to run its course, even despite what we do, or is there a possibility of revival? If these are not the end times, is there a possibility that this attendance in church can change and increase again sometime in the, in the future. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Well, they are the end times. Everything since Jesus' ascension and Pentecost is the end times. So it is the end times. There's no doubt about that. That's, you know. Um, as far as, you know, some big revival, well, you know, for each one of us, there's one person who we can actually have some influence upon. You know who that is? Yeah. You have a degree of influence over your children, and you probably have a slightly greater degree of influence over your grandchildren. <laughs> the yayas and the papus, I mean, honestly, you probably have a greater influence on your grandchildren than the parents have on them. And that's an important thing. That's a real important thing, okay? So, if we just work on ourselves, that's all we can reasonably expect, be expected to do. Because God ain't going to say, Father Botan, why isn't Joe going to church? Now, if it's because Father Botan is such an idiot and says stupid things and treats people poorly and is a bad example, well, yeah, then I'm responsible for Joe not going to church. But then if I'm doing everything I should do and keeping my nose clean and Joe still doesn't go to church, well, that's between him and God, right? So that's really the only thing we can do. And everything else depends on, on God, really. It depends on God. I mean, we see the example of these, you know, great awakenings that happen in the United States with, you know, these uh, big revival kind of things that happen religiously among the Protestants in the United States in the 19th century into the 20th century. And they all go, you know, croop and then croop, right? And what do you have left, right? So I don't think that is a paradigm to follow at all, you know? You just do what you're supposed to do, as before the face of God, fulfill your Christian responsibilities and commitments, fulfill your commitments as a student, as a son, a daughter, parent, a grandparent, just do everything as before the face of God, and don't worry about it, because the hope is always there, but the hope is never in this world. Our hope is never that we're going to have a perfect world, because as long as there's sin, we won't have a per perfect world. And that's okay. Please. Father, the question I want to make is, um, sometimes we people get together, five, six couples sit down and discuss 
over a coffee, sometimes a sports, but most of the time it, it comes up always to religion. <laughs> now we have, you know, ten, we are ten people, can agree what I say, I mean four agree, another four they don't agree, another two they say, or whatever he says, I don't believe it. <laughs> now, when you start talking to them and trying to get them to come to church, help in the church, uh, do things for God, and they say, no, we don't have to do that. We believe it. We don't want to judge, but inside the house is God. And, and I, most of them, they say, you know, I'm going, to, I'm going to paradise because I'm not going to church, but you're going to church, you might go to hell. <laughs> so what's the answer you can give to these people? Try to get them to get into our religion and stay with it. Mm -hmm. How can we help these people? Well, I'll start with what I said to him. I mean, you have to, you have to live the authentic Christian life. Because if you're out doing this and that and stealing and cursing and everything else, and you say, come to church, and they're going to say, why? So I can be like you? You know, then they have a point. But if we live that good Christian life, okay, that's number one. It's the good example, right? Number one is the good example. Now, you have the people, and this is very common. They say, I'm very spiritual, but I'm not religious. You find that everywhere, right? I have God in my heart. I don't need to go to church. I don't need this or that. Can you think of one other aspect of human life where anybody would accept that as a reasonable excuse for not doing something? Johnny, did you do your math homework? No, I didn't. Why? Because I have math in my heart. <laughs> Josephine, what are you doing here Like for the game? You haven't shown up at any practices at all. Well, I just came to be here. Are you going to play? No. Okay, you don't come to practices. You show up at the game. You're not going to play. Like, what are you doing here? Well, I have soccer in my heart. <laughs> you know, like... In no other place in your life do people have that attitude, right? Everything, we're human beings, right? <laughs> we're human beings. We have <laughs> pneuma and psyche and soma, right? Okay, we have body, soul, spirit, right? And so that involves everything. Our spiritual life involves our body. And our body life involves our spirit. This is why the moral life is so important. Because if my body, if I am um, treating my body in a sinful way, that affects my soul. And if I, in my soul, am doing sinful things, that affects my body. We're psychosomatic beings, right? We're all psychosomatic. So, a lot of times, again, the people do what they do because they want to do it. And what you get is not an excuse, but you get a rationalization. Do you know the difference? It's, they don't know that it's not an excuse, it's a rationalization. This is why I do it because, you know, because I know better, right? So with people like that, you really can't talk to them. But what I would say is... Shall we continue trying to tell them until we get to upset? You know what I would... Yeah, no, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into upset. You know what it says in the Gospel. You talk once, you talk twice, and then they don't want to hear, okay. But, but, that doesn't mean you give up totally. That just means you stop talking to them. What, what I would say, and what I do say to people like that is, okay, I understand what you're saying. I don't agree with it. My experience is different than yours. I have great joy when I go to church. I have great fulfillment. I feel fulfilled spiritually, and I'm going to pray when I'm in church that God will be with you, that God will bless you, and that God will show you the truth. And that's all. And you say that, but you have to say it if you really feel it. You can't just say it, you know, to, to make them feel bad. You have to say it from your heart, you know, that you really do want the person to come. So I'll pray for you. I'll pray that God enlightens you. 
and we'll be friends, and that's it. And that's really important, by the way, with family, with friends, with children, that you don't break the communion. The kid goes out and does stupid things, you know? Well, you don't break the communion. You know that they always have to know the door is always open. And that's the same with everybody, that people should feel, someday something may happen with a man or the woman, you know? They, God forbid, get cancer or something. And then, all of a sudden it hits them. Oh, what, you know, what so-and-so said. Maybe I'll call him and talk to him. Maybe we'll call the priest. Maybe we'll go for, you know, confession or whatever. So we never know. You never close the door. But to argue, ah, not really worth it. Better, to, better probably to play cards than to argue. Yeah, <laughs> Wait and see what God will punish you. Which is wrong, I believe. <coughs> no. that. Yeah. You know what? God, God doesn't punish. We suffer the consequences of our own sins. That's it. Anyway. I came to the church of Nairobi before. I've seen a lot of young people from age from three or four up to daily school. They want to be Sunday school, most of them now all. And uh, they're teaching the Bible, some of them. So after the 14, 15 years old, all these young people, girls or boys, they disappear from the church. Now, by possibly move some other places for study or school. What is the good for is it to go away from the church? But the church every Sunday coming on on the yeah. most yeah. On behalf of all of the Orthodox, yeah, on behalf of all of the Orthodox in North America, let me say welcome to the club. <laughs> it's the same everywhere, and you know why? There's a really a, an interesting book um, by a guy named Frank Schaefer called Letters to Father Aristotle, and it's letters that he's writing to his priest about Orthodoxy in America. He belongs to Greek Orthodox Church. He's in Massachusetts, right? And in one of, the, one of the letters he says, our ancestors came here and they made the mistake of thinking that because they saw many church steeples, that this was a Christian country. And so we sent the kids to the public schools and the public schools teach our kids not to be believers. Because in the public school, and it's different in America and Canada, but the basic principles are the same. In the public schools, the assumption is there is no God. Right? The assumption is there is no God. So that's what they grow up with. So they come to church two hours on a Sunday morning, and then they go to school seven hours a day, Monday through Friday. And then they have the movies. Remember back in the 1950s when Bing Crosby was a nice Roman Catholic priest? Can you make a movie like that nowadays? If you see a priest, he's probably going to be some kind of abuser, right? So we, you know, I, I'm not surprised at the kids. I'm not surprised that the kids leave. Because they are not getting, you know, everything they're getting is, is negative against the church. And so this is the point that unless we actually live a good Christian life, they're not going to have anything to relate it to. So this is why it's really important. And they're all not leaving, thank God, but most of them are. Everywhere. It's a big problem. After years. You know, a small, okay, one percent of, I'm sorry, a certain percentage comes back when they get married and have children. A certain percentage will come back later in life. But those are small percentages. You know, this is the thing that we, how to put it, one of my friends, very dedicated young man, Orthodox, Ukrainian Orthodox man in Toronto says, we demand nothing of our faithful, and then when that's what we get, we complain about it. So, one of the points of the talk today is, you can't just come to church. You have to go to church, but you have to receive the holy mysteries, okay? You have to read the Bible at home, you have to pray at home, you have to do the deeds of mercy, you have to live a, a, a moral life. Because all of that then makes sense, but any one of those things by itself it'll always fall apart because it doesn't have the support. Okay? But th listen, listen. Like that, like that guy said to that kid in the university. He said, every... I'm going to read it to you so that I get it exactly right. He said, there is no neutrality 
poo poo poo, where is it? Nathan, there is no such thing as neutrality. Every way of life is some way of life. Inevitably, you live either as though there were a God or as though there weren't. And in the public schools, they live as if there is no God. Yeah, well, of course. Yeah, yeah, but that's, that's it. That's the point. So the only thing we can really do, you have a Greek school. Send your kids to the Greek school. Mm -hmm. That's why it's very, very positive. Everybody. Mm -hmm. Please. Yeah, I have, I have a question. I wanted to get your thoughts on, on prayer because I think um, one of the things is, I mean, and I know in your talk you brought up prayer and, and, and as part of, you know, I guess the functions of what you do to, I guess, you know, become closer to God and sort of live in the proper Christian fashion. So I wanted to get your perspective on prayer and what prayer can do and how how that serves as one of the you know how that serves as a function of sort of leading a, leading a better Christian life yeah the question is about prayer and the place of prayer the function of prayer in the Christian life how it's important when the children are small you teach them to say Pateimon and Kerekekeritumeni Maria right you teach them the basic prayers and as they grow up you talk to them about God. Hopefully they hear about God in church, etc. Go to Holy Communion. And you can sort of increase little by little to a point, to the point where you're able to. Because once they hit high school, you know, that's, you're not going to be, they're not going to relate to you the same way a six-year-old does, right? So you give them a good basis when they're little. So they learn basic prayers. And then they always, every day, have a time to pray. And then, as part of their daily prayers, morning and evening, that they can just talk to God. Okay, who do you want to, who are we going to commemorate today? Who are we going to pray for today, right? At this time, who needs our prayers? Uh, my wife will tell you, it's really funny. When, when our kids were little, and you remember the first Gulf War in like 92 or so? And our oldest one was six at the time. And we'd be praying at night and say, okay, what do you want to pray for? And they'd say, in Ukrainian, which was very cute that Saddam Hussein would be good. Oti Saddam Hussein na inefronimos. You know, that was, you know that's, that's the kind of thing they would say, right? And that's good. And naginefronitos, um, fronimos, I think. Anyway, yeah. It's, um, when they get older, they're going to get into all of that really crazy stuff that happens when your hormones change and you become a, you know, a, an adolescent and everything else. They need something good to hang on to. So they'll be able to hang on to that insofar as they stay attached to a parish and have friends and things like that, uh, insofar as they do you know, go to Holy Confession and Holy Communion and things like that, that will be a stabilizing factor. And as they get through that, and this is where the yaya and papus are really important, or an aunt or an uncle if you have somebody who's spiritually, you know, grounded, that they can basically talk to them about it. You know, that they, the older can talk to the younger about that. It's really important. It's really important. It's a problem in the society now, in our society, um, that the young people have what they call this peer orientation. Their relationships are all horizontal to other people their own age, and the vertical relationships to the parents, to the grandparents, aunts, uncles, etc., that those are very often deficient to the point of being non-existent. That's horrible. That's just a horrible, horrible thing because you need, the kids need the wisdom from previous ages. Okay? It's like, we're both blind and we're walking along and, you know, you tell me where to go and I'll tell you where to go, but we don't know where we're going because we can't see. Well, that's what it's like for a lot of the young people nowadays. So this is why these relationships with the older people are so important. And this is where, when they, especially in the teenage years, where they can help them through that. And at this point, they should be able to, you know, they should know the set prayers and they should be able to um, formulate in their own mind and heart their needs and wishes and desires and be able to just pray quietly with that 
And here, the Jesus prayer is really important. The kids should learn the Jesus prayer. And you give them a comboschini or one of these, and you tell them what's the, what it's for. It's not a bracelet, right? You're going to have a test. You go sit in the back of the cafeteria, and you, you just say 33 times, Lord Jesus Christ, Kiri Su Christe, okay? And you teach them about that. Because it has to be real in their lives. And how can it be real in their lives if they never experiment? Because This is how you learn. You experiment. So you try that. And geez, I did my prayer rope and I was relaxed for the test and it went, well, oh, that's a good thing. And again, it works on many levels. It works on spiritual, psychological, uh, soul, body, etc. Okay? And then hopefully, the, the statistics are very clear. If you hold on to the kids through university, you'll hold on to them for the rest of their lives. That's the statistics. If you hold on to them through the university years, you'll hold on to them for the rest of their lives. This is why the OCFs, the Orthodox Christian Fellowships at the universities, are so important. Uh, the kids at the universities have to have some way to explore that uh, reality within them, that spiritual reality. So keeping the kids connected to church while they're in university. If, they are, if there's an OCF, you get together like that. During the summer, there might be a camp. I don't know if you're aware, the Antiochians have this college conference in Ligonier and in Cali Pennsylvania and in California over, um, over Christmas break from the 27th to the 31st of December every year. They'll have 400, I think 400 here and 200 in California, Orthodox University students all together with talks, with this, with that, with the other. Over March break, they have what they call real break, where they go and do different things. Like every year, a group will go last year. Our director of youth ministry for Ukrainian Orthodox Church in the United States took a group of 10 kids over to Constantinople, where they went, and for the week, they cleaned up an old cemetery by, you know what it's like in Constantinople there. So... This, you know, the, 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 the church isn't functioning. There's a Christian cemetery. They overgrown. They went, they cleaned everything up, made it nice and, you know, nice again and everything. And it's a good ministry in front of the Turks because the Turks come by and they see, what are you doing? Why are you doing that? You come from America and you're cleaning up, you know, this, just the way we respect the dead, our ancestors, etc. So gigantic, you know, really good things like that that happen. And then in the summer during the camps. So just to keep them connected. That'll be a gigantic thing.